see it. I can see it. I can. I can see it. I can see it. It's fantastic. My talk is up on the screen. Isn't that wonderful? All right. So now, Luke, you have to be quiet for a few moments while I introduce you. <laughs> so welcome, That's everybody. Uh, I just want to uh, welcome you all again to the uh, fifth annual BSI conference. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we have over 950 participants from over 100 countries, and we have a wonderful lineup of talks over the next couple of days. And to kick things off, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to introduce our first speaker, but perhaps I should let you know who I am. I'm uh, Eleanor Fish at the University of Toronto. And I'm one of the co-founders of the Beyond Sciences Initiative and also a research scientist myself. So Luke O'Neill, um, he is a professor of biochemistry in the School of Biochemistry and Immunology, Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Um, he is uh, most definitely a world expert on innate immunity and inflammation. And his main research interests, um, which uh, changed quite a lot, Luke, over the years, are in toll-like receptors, inflammasomes, and most recently on uh, immunometabolism. He, he's listed by Thomson Reuters uh, in the top 1% of immunolo immunologists in the world based on citations per paper. He is a co-founder of uh, Inflazome, and Citrix, which aim to develop new medicines for inflammatory diseases. Um, he was awarded the Royal Dublin Society Irish Times Boyle Medal for Scientific Excellence, um, the Royal Irish Academy Gold Medal for Life Sciences, the Society for Leukocyte Biology Dolph O. Adams Award, and um, in 2018, the 2018 Milstein Award from the International Cytokine and Interference Society. He's a member of the Royal a Irish Academy, EMBO, and a fellow of the Royal Society. Luke also has a passion for uh, communicating science to the public. He's on a weekly radio slot on the Pat Kenny Show on News Talk. And um, in 2018, he published with Gil the best selling Humanology A Scientist's Guide to Our Amazing Existence. Um, he also is an accomplished musician and um, published uh, also with Gill the great Irish science book, a science book for uh, youth, 10 to 12 year olds. So without any further delay, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our keynote, Luke O'Neill, who's going to talk to us on adventures in inflammasome research. Over to you, Luke. Great. Thanks very much, Eleanor. I hope everybody can hear me. This is an interesting thing to do. I haven't done this before, so uh, but I'm delighted to take part because, you know, we travel by aeroplane far too much. I feel very guilty about all these flights I take, you see. So this is a really good initiative. Well done, Eleanor, for asking me because I'm very happy to do it. <laughs> and I hope you can get a, a feel for the kind of research that we're doing in my lab. And um, as Eleanor has said, um, my, my big research area for the past 30 years really has been inflammation and the inflammatory process. And then, of course, innate immunity is very much part of that sort of event, I guess. And then the real dream, of course, is that we'll discover mechanisms here and pathways that might be amenable to therapeutic manipulation, because there's so many diseases that involve the inflammatory process and innate immunity that if we can get new insights into what's going wrong in the immune system, we might be able to design new therapies. And, and today I'm going to really give you two or three stories, I guess, uh, that speak to that theme, I suppose. I'm going to talk about chromosomes, which is a big passion for me over the years, and then immunometabolism. As Eleanor said, my lab, like seven, eight, nine years ago, began to get into metabolic pathways during an immunity and how they might affect, say, macrophage function or T cell function. And that's opened up a whole new area for many immunologists. It seems as a very exciting uh, sort of development, I guess. And my main metabolic focus is going to be on this first slide which is about Krebs cycle, which often strikes fear in the heart of immunologists. But don't be worried, I will take you to Krebs cycle yet again and lead you to the power plant. Because it's a very important cycle, as you know, but it turns out to go wrong in inflammation. And that's kind of a new area that's emerged. But that we're going to head towards that. Now, the next slide then, um, just to get you into it in a sense, I mean, for all these diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, or a inflammatory bowel disease, MS, 
They are involved with dysfunction in inflammation and in the immunity. And the truth of it is that the current therapies will get to the ceiling, is the view. So, you know, biologics. And the next slide kind of captures this as well, I guess. So things like anti-cytokine therapy um, will get you to a certain point, and, and anti-T cell therapy, and tar things that target B cells. They will get you, most clinicians would agree, you might get to 50% response. It's hard to get beyond that. Now, some diseases, uh, like psoriasis, they, they're getting to 80 90% response by targeting things like IL-23 and other cytokines. Or all 17. So there is hope that maybe we'll break this seeding by targeting cytokines in a better way, maybe, or using combinations. But many of us believe to go beyond that seeding, we need something different. And in this next slide here, you'll see where my ideas lie. Maybe the stroma, maybe. Now, what's meant by that is the fibroblast in the tissue, maybe, or the endothelium would be targetable. NLRP3 and cell death, I'm going to mention that a little bit more in a minute. That might be a good target to break that ceiling. Uh, and then metabolism. These areas are so different in a way from the standard um, pharmacological areas that drug companies will be going after for the moment, you know. And they're outside that, so therefore if we combine them now or, or learn more about them, we may well break this ceiling and get much better patient responses. And that's kind of an overarching concept that these newer things, that are slightly outside the immune system, must be said, but still important for it, may be targetable, and then we might break through that, that ceiling. That's the kind of um, the kind of approach that we're now advocating. And just briefly, I'm going to talk about two of the NLRP3 first. I've got them in red now on that next slide. And NLRP3 emerged, it was discovered in 2001 by Jörg Chop working in Lausanne, and by Hal Hoffman, who found the gene was mutated in a very rare sort of auto-inflammatory diseases. That begins this journey. And then um, suddenly, in, in the space of sort of five or six years, I guess. Just for a moment. I think because of the phone audio, uh, it would help if uh, you speak up just a little bit. I think some people are having a little bit of difficulty uh, hearing everything. Okay. I, I, I apologize. I'm quite loud, I must be said. <laughs> 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 It's always frightening when you're talking and nobody's coming back, so that's well worth knowing. I'll try and speak, I'll speak a bit more loud. Would that help? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I'll try, I'll try and speak more loud. So, so this slide here, NLRP3, it's in the middle of all these diseases because it's sensing pathogens and it's sensing damage. Damps are coming off damaged tissue. And amazingly, many different diseases may involve this pathway. And we've got things like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is in here, rheumatoid arthritis, gout here, uh, metabolism, things like atherosclerosis, that's cholesterol crystals. So many different diseases seem to involve this pathway. And what's happening is the macrophage, which has an all can see, is sensing various noxious things, the top there you see noxious things. And that can be beta amyloid in Alzheimer's, or maybe uric acid crystals in gout. So it's a very interesting kind of common pathway for many things. And we wondered, um, I guess, and here's some of the particles, so cholesterol in atherosclerosis, IAPP, an amyloid factor in diabetes, uric acid crystals in, in, uh, in gout, for instance, alpha synuclein. All, all of these things are noxious. And they build up, especially as we age, and the macrophage tries to clear them, and that causes inflammation, and that causes all the problems of those diseases. Now, what this means is if we target them then, and, um, you know, targeting them could be very useful. We might limit some of these different diseases. And this next slide uh, conveys for you what I think are four main pathways now in inflammation that might yield new therapies. And many of us are very interested in these pathways. There's the jack stat pathway that cytokines drive, very well studied. And we know in the clinic, blocking jacks might work to stop inflammation. Uh, there's a C-gas sting pathway that senses DNA in, in, into the, in the place of damage and DNA in the wrong place. NLRP3 is sensing noxious things. And then the TNF pathway through lip kinases. These four pathways, I think, may be all you need if, if you target these pathways. And my next slide says that. Getting inhibitors of these pathways may well yield exciting new treatments for these diseases. And already the JAK inhibitors are in the clinic. They're showing efficacy in things like rheumatoid, in psoriasis. The others are in development. So companies are developing C-gas inhibitors, and a lot of three inhibitors, and with kinase inhibitors, just to see if they would work. And there's a lot of excitement now, because these may well yield new therapies. And uh, we tried to find a very specific inhibitor of NLRP3, 
to feed inflammation, and lo and behold, we found one. This drug is called CRID-3. It was first found by Pfizer, 1997, a long time ago they discovered this drug. Uh, it's a, it's another name is MCC-950, it's the same molecule. Um, and that turns out to be a very specific NLRP3 inhibitor. I can tell it at that path, right? And that particular agent then, we gave that out to, we published on this in 2015, uh, we gave it out to 50 labs just to see what would happen. And amazingly, that small molecule inhibitor of NLRP3 works in more than 50 inflammation models, mainly in mice. So we've got models of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, brain injury, migraine, atherosclerosis, heart failure, NASH, MS, psoriasis, lupus, these rare diseases, they're called CAPS, that's where you get a, a mutation in this pathway. Steroid refractory asthma is in there, and then certain infections it's protected in, because they cause a kind of an inflammatory process. So incredibly, I mean, here's a single pathway, which you block with a small molecule, and in mice anyway, all of those models, you don't see inflammation. So maybe this is true. Maybe NLRP3 is this central pathway that drives all these diseases, and remember, the idea here is it's sensing noxious things that build up, and it could be anything in the body that builds up in a noxious way. Because we don't know why some of these things build up. Like, we don't know why beta amyloid would build up, for instance, in Alzheimer's. But still, this pathway seems to sense it. So we're very excited. And on the back of that, then, as Eleanor said, uh, we got a company going in for uh, That compound, CRID-3, that was never going to make it in the clinic <coughs> for various reasons. It wasn't optimal. And Pfizer dropped it. So we've made new ones in Zomad and Somalix, and we're now just finishing our phase one trial. Our phase two trials are about to begin in these rare diseases, and who knows, maybe this inhibitor might work in a whole range of diseases. Other companies, of course, have inhibitors as well, so somebody might get there first, and we'll see what happens. But it's a very important time in many ways, because we now have a, a handle, maybe, on some of these really serious diseases. Now, the next thing then is, what's also common to these pathways is mitochondrial dysfunction. So when you have an inflammatory cell or the inflamed state, mitochondria go weird. That's a very simple phrase for you. And they begin to release reactive oxygen. They begin to release their DNA and sea gas here can sense that for instance. NLRP3 is driven by mitochondrial reactive oxygen. So we know mitochondrial dysfunction is important and we know metabolic change that must be important. That brings us now to immunometabolism and what's happening with the inflammatory process. And here's a kind of a concept that I configured a couple of years ago where inflammatory stimuli and it could be cytokines it could be pattern recognition or something like the TLRs for instance it could be metabolites cause metabolic reprogramming that will then change the phenotype of the cell through this reprogramming event and you get inflammatory gene expression and they're now going to push towards disease that's the kind of new idea and now metabolic reprogramming is now sort of part of our understanding of what's happening during immune cell activation, especially in the context of innate immunity, you think. And that became a kind of a concept four or five years ago that we're very intrigued by. And it's amazing this area has taken off like a rocket. These are numbers of publications and the years. And as you can see, beginning about 2010, it was always going on, by the way. Some of this stuff was discovered 50 years ago that there was a, a metabolic change. But now, look at this, 15, 16, the number of papers has gone up hugely. So suddenly immunologists, are looking at, at, at immune metabolism now as a key part of what they're interested in. And, um, you know, a great book, if you want to read about this, is Navigating Metabolism. It's by a great mitochondrial guru called Nav Chandel. Superb, like bringing up the speed on these metabolic pathways. And Nav says something very interesting in this book. He says, metabolism is the driver, genes are the passenger. So the primacy of gene expression and, and genetic uh, sort of... Um, differences to explain disease is, is moving away slightly because it turns out metabolism is read out as a gene expression change. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, I was at a Keystone meeting back a couple of weeks ago, and Richard Loxley, who's a very famous immunologist, uh, he said the increase in asthma energy cannot be explained by genetics. It's too soon, you see. So variants in genes can't explain the increased incidence of these diseases, and many inflammatory diseases the incidence is going up the whole time, and it's too fast to be explained by genetics. And then Nav says what has changed is not our genes, but our diet, environment, and behavior. They've changed. And metabolism is poised to sense these modifications to drive gene expression and cause disease. 
So understanding metabolism may provide new therapeutic targets is the idea. Now, how could metabolism link into gene expression is the question. And it's quite simple, it's epigenetics. So metabolites control the epigenome. So acetyl-CoA is acetylation of, say, histones. Alpha-KG is essential for demethylase, the DNA demethylases, or histone demethylases. Succinate inhibits these demethylases. And of course, carbon-1 metabolism, which involves uh, S-adenosyl methionine, for instance, is needed for methylation. So, so what's happening, we think, is environmental change. And that might be diet, it might be lack of exercise, it could be something toxicological. Metabolism is changing. And that metabolism then alters gene expression through an epigenetic modification. That's the kind of big idea that we now have. And this will begin to explain these diseases. And as I say, give rise to possible new therapeutic approaches. Now, what this also means is um, the, the metabolic shift then is critical. And to keep it relatively simple, in inflammation, the shift is called Warburg metabolism. That's the word they use for this. And what it involves is Glycolysis goes a bit strange. I call this aberrant glycolysis. It's also called aerobic glycolysis. And then, as I say, the mitochondria change. And that is the essence of Warburg, a change in glycolysis and a change in mitochondria. And those are the two things that we're most focused on now. And what's happening as well is there's been a rise in interest in mitochondria. And here's a great example of, you know, competition of the organelles, you'll call it. Guess what's winning that battle? Mitochondria have overtaken the nucleus, thankfully, at last. And don't work on the Galgi, it's really boring. That's a joke. Okay, so the mitochondria are, are, are much more important now, and that's mainly because of immunologists um, discovering stuff in the mitochondria. So it's very interesting how this, this shift has happened. And the phrase I use here is metabolism trumps genetics, because we need to know a lot more about metabolism now to understand how the genes are misbehaving in disease. And that misbehavior involves altered expression. And that expression is being driven by epigenetic change is the idea, and metabolism is driving that process. It's a very complicated yet exciting area. Now, let me now give you two or three examples from my own lab of the sort of things we're doing. Now, remember, the essence of the inflammatory state in a macrophage, for example, is aberrant glycolysis. So glycolysis goes weird and mitochondrial dysfunction. And these two stories, I'm going to tell you now how what we've discovered, a little examples of what we've discovered with glycolysis going a bit strange and the mitochondria going strange in inflammation. And the glycolysis story is about an enzyme called PKM2. That's an enzyme in glycolysis. And we've discovered a critical role in inflammatory macrophage and TH17 cell activation. TH17s are the central pro-inflammatory T cell, and PKM2 in glycolysis we found is critical for these two cell types. And then secondly, a role for succinase, which is in Krebs cycle, and a metabolite called itaconate, which comes off Krebs cycle, and that's a very interesting balancing act, and it's reborn now is the word I use. Krebs cycle is now reborn in the macrophage, and they're the two big stories I want to tell you. So PKM2, first of all, now it is the last step in glycolysis. It turns PEP into pyruvate. That's the last step in glycolysis. And it occurs in two states, a tetramer. The tetramer can do the PEP to pyruvate conversion. It's the enzyme in glycolysis. And a dimer. And amazingly, the dimeric form goes to the nucleus. It's got non-enzymatic functions and can change gene expression. So it's a very interesting enzyme because it's a moonlight, we call it. So two jobs. The day job is glycolysis here. And the other job is to change gene expression in the nucleus. So the dimer is less active as an enzyme and it moonlight, and then the tetramer is more active. So very interesting. That was discovered years ago now, this dimer tetramer thing. And then we showed that in macrophages, the dimer is pro-inflammatory and the tetramer is anti. So there's a real balancing act here between these two. And we published a paper in macrophages where the dimer of PKM2 goes to the nucleus Interacts with HIF, a very important transcription factor. This year's Nobel Prize was for HIF. That interaction drives IL-1 production, and IL-1 is a very important inflammatory cytokine. It also drives the Warburg shift in general and drives glycolysis. LDH goes up, the glucose transporter. So we're boosting metabolic change and driving IL-1 through dimeric PKM2. And what's very interesting is you can force a dimer into a tetramer, so you can shift it. 
to attach them with, with drugs, small molecules, DASA and TEP, and they stop the dimer, and they're anti-inflammatory. They decrease IL-1 because they have lost that dimer. And the other thing is, um, if you go in vivo, for instance, with these compounds, we've given mice then uh, the, the one that tetramerizes, the TEP compound, and you block IL-1 in vivo, and you boost IL-10. You're, you're driving an anti-inflammatory state if you force PKM2 away from a dimer into a tetramer. And that was a nice observation. And then more recently, we looked at T cells. And it got even better. So first of all, you get this is dimeric PKM2 in a Western. You might measure a series of phthalates at the dimer. It goes up and activated T cells. Look at this. It's all in the nucleus by 48 hours. The signs of case when you activate T cells. So thin T cells, and it's driving dimerization and nuclear translocation during activation. We then got the, the tetramerizer, the compound that prevents the dimer. And look at this. It blocks proliferation in the T cell. Secondly, it blocks cytokine production from T cells. TNF is made by inflammatory T cells. The tetramerizer blocks the TNF production. That was quite neat as well. Thirdly, it blocks TH17 T cells. It stops all the TH17 cytokine is now blocked by the compound. These transcription factors are tied into TH17 differentiation. They're inhibited as Aurora alpha is inhibited, which is nice to see. We looked at TH1 cells, and they are blocked as well. Here's interferon gamma, very important TH1 cytokine, blocked by the tetramerizer very nicely. And E only is the transcription factor here, not TBES, interestingly, for those who are aficionados. And then what was also happening that was great was we got a boost towards T regs. Here we see FOXP3 going up now. That's a Treg marker. TH17 has become Tregs. Here's, here's FOXP3 in the Treg different, uh, the TH17 differentiation. We're boosting FOXP3. Same in the TH1 profile. So what, what this means is we're shifting the inflammatory T cells into a regulatory state, which is anti-inflammatory, by targeting an enzyme in glycolysis, PKM2. And now we went in vivo, and um, I'll skip that just to take a time. We go in vivo, and a good model of TH17 pathology is EAE. It's experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, an MS model. And look at this. You give the mice the compound to target PKM2, and onset is delayed. So these mice are developing EAE. They're becoming paralyzed. Then there's a score. You give them the tetramerizer, and they push out. They get a delay in onset, you see. And here's the delay of onset here. So it's working in vivo in a TH17 type model. And then we, uh, we'll skip that one for the sake of time. Um, the bottom line then, PKM2 could be targeted. It's moonlighting effect for therapeutic utility. And my next slide kind of covers this in a, in a straightforward way. Here's metabolism. Very, very complicated. You don't need to know about that. This is all you need to know. That dimer, that PKM2 dimer will drive HIF and various pathways. And that then will promote uh, inflammatory gene expression, you see. So once you get downstream of this, you drive inflammation in those cells. Now, what's also very nice is this. Here are TH0 cells. They will become TH17s in inflammation, or Tregs, which are anti-inflammatory. If you target these pathways with small molecules, block glycolysis, say, the 2-deoxyglucose, or try our compound, the PKM2 targeting compound, you boost Tregs and you limit TH17. Now, that's a very interesting concept because we're now promoting an anti-inflammatory state in response to metabolic inhibition and again it's the idea of metabolic reprogramming then having a key role in what type of t-cell you get so this is one little example of how when you target glycolysis you get these effects now can everybody still hear me is the next question hello hello Ah, Jesus. Are you going to hear me? Okay, I thought I was, I, was I talking to my... Was I talking <laughs> to my... Hear you and there are questions oh, you hear me? Yes, uh, and please go ahead. You, you can go after the lot of time as we started. It's, it's fine. Okay, I'll keep going. I'm, I'm glad people can keep hear going. me. I thought I'd like okay. everybody. Okay, right. I'll keep going. Now, now, the second part is Krebs cycle. So I told you already, glycolysis, pro-inflammatory, PKM2, a key part of that process. If you target PKM2 and force this tumor away from a dimer, you'll block TH17 cells, and you'll also block inflammatory macrophages. That's the first story. Now, 
the second story is about Krebs cycle. And reborn, because it's very interesting. Now, you all know Krebs cycle, I hope. There it is, turning around. Almost intermediate. It's day job that was discovered in the 20th century. Very big discovery. It's for ATP production. It makes NADH, FADH, electron transport. ATP is what you all learned. It's also the central hub of all metabolism, Krebs cycle. You can make amino acids from Krebs cycle for protein production. You can make purines and pyrimidines for nucleotides. You can make lipids for membranes. So this is a core metabolic hub of all cells. Now, what I want to tell you, though, it gets even better because changes in this cycle drive inflammation. And I'm going to show you an, an example of that. And then it can be anti-inflammatory as well. So we've discovered in my lab and several labs how this Krebs cycle suddenly becomes more interesting in the context of the inflammatory state is the idea. Now, um, this is how you remember it, I imagine. Learn Krebs cycle, forget Krebs cycle, learn Krebs cycle. That's the real Krebs cycle. I can hear everybody laughing. Isn't it? Now, next slide. Um, let's see now. The, uh, the, the other thing I'm, I'm going to tell you about then is how this becomes inflammatory. And there's succinate. I'm going to tell you that. And then a new thing, a metabolite called coming off a conotase, the enzyme one is one. This is diversion away from Krebs. I'm going to give you that story. And this metabolite, like the turns out to be anti inflammatory. It's got potent anti inflammatory effects. And just very briefly, there is its structure, and we think it's an aminomodulatory metabolite. Now, um, and it comes off Krebs cycle. So it's really interesting. Krebs thought itaconate was part of Krebs cycle, but it's a diversion away. This happens in the inflammatory macrophage, this diversion. And if I give you um, a couple of things on itaconate, it's antibacterial. That goes back a good few years. It blocks certain pathways in bacteria. There's also evidence of antiviral effects. There's a block type 1 interferons. We published that. It can target Zika, influenza, VSV. There's recent papers on, on somehow having antiviral properties. So who'd have thought that a Krebs cycle intermediate would affect viruses? And that's the literature that's out there at the moment. Now, um, we found it's very high in macrophages. So as I tack and it goes up hugely in macrophages with LPS. So you see it appearing in the macrophage. And then we wonder what does it do? What's its mechanism? This is a review we did last year for cell. Now, we've shown succinate can be metabolized and through complex one can generate reactive oxygen to drive HIF, and HIF is very inflammatory. That's an inflammatory role for succinate. And the Max Artyomov showed Itaconate can block that. So Itaconate can block succinate metabolism. That's one reason why it's anti-inflammatory, because succinate's pro-inflammatory, Itaconate anti. We then show that Itaconate comes out of the mitochondria and drives NRF2 by modifying a protein called KEEP1. And that, that can drive gene expression and can have an anti-inflammatory effect, because NRF2 is anti-inflammatory. Succinate can also go through a receptor to be pro-inflammatory. And then Max also showed Itaconate can drive ATF3 and that suppresses inflammation. So it's a very complex picture is emerging of these two metabolites. One is anti-inflammatory, we think, through things like NRF2, and one is pro, that succinates generating ROS, and ROS, reactive oxygen, is, is, is pro-inflammatory. So again, who would have thought Krebs cycle intermediate would have those functions? And um, here's two examples. If you give mice itaconate, and they give them LPS, they don't die as much. So it's, it's anti-inflammatory in vivo. You're prolonging life here in a model of sepsis, because LPS is used as a way to drive sepsis. Secondly, if you knock it down in human macrophages, and then uh, you knock down IOG1, the enzyme that makes it, so we're knocking down itaconate here, you boost IL1. That's, an, that's if, you, if you get rid of it from the system. So again, it's evidence that it's anti-inflammatory in this context anyway. And then, to cut a long story short, um, I'll skip over these for time, it turns out this metabolite modifies a range of proteins by reacting with key cysteine residues. So itaconate can react with cysteines and modify them. And that's, a, that's another new idea, I guess. And in NRF2, it's KEEP1, I think I'll give to that in presentation, LDH, like the dehydrogenase, and XNA1 drives across the ground. And all of these are modified by this metabolite and turned off, so it limits those pathways. So again, it seems to be a signal to limit inflammation by modifying cysteines on key target proteins. And then very nicely, a group in Beijing, Chu Wang, confirmed our work, which is nice, different method. He did cytokine uh, cysteine profiling. And again, he found, like us, he found LDHA, 
That was modified. He found two more enzymes in glycolysis were modified by attacking eight, and it's turning off glycolysis here. And remember, glycolysis is pro-inflammatory. So when attacking eight targets glycolysis, it switches off that process. It's not quite neat because it can find that work and then extends the mechanism, I guess. Um, and then uh, I'll just go on quickly for time. We found the same thing, by the way. In the IG1 knockout macrophage, and you give them LPS, all of glycolysis goes up. These red means glycolysis going up. So, and they're missing ataconate. So ataconate's inhibiting glycolysis is the idea as an anti-inflammatory process. And so we now add a repression of glycolysis as part of ataconate's effects in macrophages to block the inflammatory process by, by inhibiting that pathway. And then finally then, um, we've gone back to the very start in a way, we wondered about NLRP3, remember what I mentioned earlier, a key central inflammatory pathway in macrophages. Would that be blocked by ataconate? Now, the reason why we thought that was ROS from mitochondria will drive NLRP3. So if we were getting a sort of 2-NRF2, for instance, an antioxidant response and blocking ROS, that might block NLRP3. That was our initial idea. But it got better than that. Watch what happens next. So first of all, this is an assay for NLRP3. You can drive IL-1 with ATP, blocked by ataconate, very nice inhibition. Nigerisin can be used something with a stimulant, again, blocked. And then we got a really big effect on IL-18, actually, and IL-18 comes off NLRP3, blocked by ataconate. So it does seem to block NLRP3. That was the first thing we saw. And then it blocks cell death, because that NLRP3 drives a type of cell death called pyroptosis. Again, that was blocked. And here we see two different stimuli. Again, we're seeing inhibition. That was nice as well. And then um, you can get formation of what are called ASC specs. It's, it's a multi-protein complex NLRP3. And that was blocked very nicely again. And here we see actual specs being blocked on a Western analysis. So again, it's targeting the inflammasome NLRP3. It didn't block AM2. That's a separate inflammasome, sort of specificity here. That was quite neat to see because you want to be specific. That was good. And then um, we then took samples from CAPS patients. These are patients who got the activating mutation in NLRP3. And again, we got an ambition ex vivo with our itaxinate blocking that pathway very nicely. So again, that's patient samples where NLRP3 is inhibited. Um, we reconstituted the whole inflammasome in 293 cells by overexpressing them all. And then we overexpress IRG1, the enzyme that makes it, and then we blocked it. So that was good. We're overexpressing IRG1 to drive ataconate. And again, we're getting inhibition. That's more evidence for that. And then um, finally, the knockout mice, these are IRG1 deficient macrophages. And you can boost an RP3 because, of course, you're losing this inhibitory pathway. So that's more evidence, if you like, that this is happening in, in, in the case of a knockout context. Um, and then no effect on A2 in the knockout, so it's got a good control as well. And then finally, then, the question is, um, what's the mechanism? Now, it turns out it wasn't NRF2. Remember, our first idea was NRF2 will have an antioxidant response. And we can see attacking its thin inhibitory in the NRF2 knockout. So we could rule out NRF2 as a possible uh, mechanism there. The big question then is what's it doing? So it's targeting NLRP3. Uh, Next 7 is another protein in that complex. And we wondered then, was it direct cysteine modification? And there had been evidence of a key cysteine called cyst275 in NLRP2, a drug called aridonin could block that cysteine. And we wondered then, would itaconate block that cysteine? And lo and behold, it does. Um, here's the mass spec data. Cyst548 in NLRP3 is being modified by itaconate. And we set the mechanism. And I'm very excited because uh, Chu, the other group, found the same target. He's got a paper under review where he finds um, NLRP3 modified on the same cysteine. He's confirmed our data, which is quite nice to see. So we think NLRP3 is indeed a target. And now we add NLRP3, and that's being blocked by ataconate. Now, again, I can't overemphasize how much this is interesting. Here's a Krebs cycle derived metabolite, coming off Krebs cycle, inhibiting inflammation, like a negative feedback loop. And so Krebs now is firmly involved in these processes and an anti-inflammatory metabolite countering the pro-inflammatory succinate pathway. So it brings Krebs cycle then firmly into the frame in many ways. Now, finally then, just very briefly, uh, a bit more human data, because of course this is all quite nice and um, 
you know, we can see evidence in, in mice and so on in macrophages. A paper came out about six months ago. There's a variant in IRG1 in humans, and it changed an asparagine to a serine, this variant in humans, and it's much more active as an enzyme, that variant. And guess what? It occurs in about 20% of the African population. It's very low in Europe, but 20% of Africans have this variant in IRG1 is three times more active. Now, that's really interesting, because what would that be, and why would it be so high in that population? And um, Mihai Natea, a very important collaborator, and Vina Kaparia, who's a postdoc in his lab, we got cells from African patients that carry that variant, gave them an adjuvant, in this case, measured interferon gamma and IL-5, and there was less in the patients carrying the overactive variant. Less gamma, less IL-5. Now remember, this is an activating variant. It's driving an anti-inflammatory process, I guess, uh, when it's overactive and they're making less cytokines. So these, these people here have overactive itaconate, and lo and behold, they make less cytokines because they've got a slightly more anti-inflammatory state. And that suggests in humans now, this pathway could be very important. So we're very excited about that data because it confirms in humans an anti-inflammatory effect. So where are we now? This is my summary. So I've given you a lot of information there. I hope you can hear me. I'm begging to God that you can hear me. Um, but we have two big stories here. The first one is, will NLRP3 inhibitors make it? I told you at the start, a really interesting challenge. Let's see what happens in the clinic now. They may not work. Many drugs fail. It's very difficult, but let's see. Secondly, immune metabolism, new frontier, reprogramming could be great. It works already. Methotrexate in humans, metformin. They're metabolic reprogramming, and they're anti-inflammatory. New targets, PKM2. Very interesting, itaconate and the anti-inflammatory things it does. So here we have two metabolic stories now, perhaps giving rise to other approaches in different contexts to limit inflammation, and that's the kind of hope that we have. And I'll finish there, just to put in the lab. Uh, Dylan Ryan, there he is, Ivana Mills. They did all the work on the itaconate that I showed you. Um, that was very important. And then on, on, on the initial part. And then very importantly, Alex Hoofman, he did all the work on NLRP3 modification with itaconate. Stefano Angieri did all the work on PKM2, and they're in the lab doing all the hard work. I'm doing nothing effectively except talking on the phone. They did the lab work. Tremendous. Big thanks to them. And then the collaborators, very important, Cambridge, Mike Murphy, key guy, Christian Fraser, they really helped us a huge amount with many things. Mike was a big inspiration for much of this. Me, I told you, and Vinod. They had the patient samples. Richard Hartley is a chemist in Glasgow who made the reagents and gave us up to chemistry advice. Roman Fisher found the system modification for us, an attack and ace. Some of this was done in DSK. Uh, Louise Modis was leading there. She was very helpful as well. European Research Council, Welcome Trust, Science Foundation Artists and GSK gave us the money to do all the work. Thank you very much. I hope you could hear me and understand my accent. Absolutely, Luke. Thank you very much. That was an amazing talk. <laughs> We've got time for it was unusual, Albert. Unusual. <laughs> it was unusual, certainly. Um, I hope I hope people could hear me, and and I'm very happy to answer any questions, or if you want to email me or send them now or whatever's easy. All right, I'm, I'm going to pose some questions that we received already during your talk, and what I'd ask Great. you is if yep. maybe you have time afterwards, you could go stay online and you can see the questions and answer them in the chat room. So the first question would yep. be. Could MCC 950 use, uh, be useful for the treatment of lung inflammation accompanying such virus infections as the 2019 novel coronavirus? <laughs> very topical, very topical. Um, well, I don't know, I haven't done that yet. I did get an email about that though, a coronavirus expert asked me to help to just do that very experiment, you know? So, I mean, we do see effects in lung models. So, for instance, in asthma models, we see an anti-inflammatory effect. So there could be a, a, a lung protective mechanism anyway, in general. Um, secondly, it kills influenza, this stuff, amazingly, in vivo. Now, the question is, is that through the immune system or is there some antiviral effect? We don't know. But there's been, uh, the slide I showed earlier, there's evidence for an anti-influenza effect. And that's not a million miles away, maybe. You know, it also works on chikungunya virus. 
uh, what's on Zika, amazingly. So there is antiviral effects here, so that's a really interesting prospect, we think. You know, the, I suspect uh, there's better yeah. ways to do it. Though, but. We're setting up a trial in China right now during the outbreak with uh, interferon. Maybe you and I should chat and we can see whether we can use MCC 950 as well. Here's yeah, another question. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there any memory associated with the inflammasome pathway? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, well, Mihai Matea and Ika Lat actually, they, they looked at innate immune memory in that pathway. And, and Ika had a paper, I think about a couple of years ago now, on the high fat diet activating NLRP3 and then you get epigenetic sort of memory in the system somehow yeah so nobody looked directly at that say for, to look at epigenetic modification of the NLRP3 system but I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's the case I think the other thing to mention is there's a thing called TET2 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 brings out a myeloid population that are very high in NLRP3 and that and TET2 is a demethylase you know so there's something going on with innate memory and the inflammasome for deafness that needs more work. That's a good question to ask. Thank you very much. Okay, we'd like to thank you again, Luke, and invite you to stay and uh, online and enjoy the rest of the conference. And as I said, there will be other questions. If you're happy to answer them, that would be great. Thank yep. you very much again. No problem.